So uh, obviously this is about plug and uh, doing web development in it because that is its main focus is web development. Um, I've only got like 15 slides, including this one. Um, so hopefully we can get through this and then um, spin up a demo app uh, we can actually get stuff done because uh, that's what everybody really wants to see. Um, so what we want to cover, what is plug, right? Uh, what is it? Um, what's it composed of? Um, what can we use it for? Um, essentially, plug itself is just the specification, right? Um, for composable modules. Uh, that's just fanciness for being able to take a lot of different pieces of code and lump them together into one solid congruent thing. Um, and then we get applications like Phoenix and all that crap that you might do that uh, make the world go around. Um, the other bit is the connection adapters that come with it. Uh, currently, that's only Cowboy, so we're going to like kind of glance over those. Um, but in theory, people can uh, write connection adapters for any sort of web server that is on the, the Erlang VM, right? You can have uh, Eli or uh, Moki Web or whatever, um, and have them, as long as they can you know, send and receive responses, um, have the correct uh, adapter built for them so that they can work plug. So you can essentially just switch out the adapters um, that you want to use to switch out the, the possible web servers that are available. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen one pull request for Eli, but they had to revamp it because of recent changes. Um, but really the only one that anybody ever uses is Cowboy. But it does what it does. Is Phoenix a plug? Uh, it has many plugs. It's built on plug. Okay. Um, and there are, many plugs. Okay. Yeah, there, there are, there's a lot that goes on. Um, like the controller might be a plug. Uh, yeah, um, a lot of the structure can be like that. I haven't looked into it that deeply, um, but I can make some uh, relations to the endpoints in the, the router later down the road once we cover the router, um, because there is that's essentially what they are. They're, they're plugs, both of them are. Um, so uh, plugs can be of two forms. Um, the basic form is a function plug. Uh, it really just needs to follow this convention of um, taking a, a connection um, and a set of options, um, and then it returns a new connection. Right. Um, so the plug itself uh, has a builder, which we'll cover here in a little bit, that has um, a macro called plug, um, and accepts uh, the plug itself and then a set of options. Um, this option can be a string, a uh, keyword list, a map, whatever you want to use, um, and that will eventually get passed into uh, the plugs, and specifically the one that you're actually adding the options to. Next, um, we do really just, just a, a simple definition, right? Um, plain Jane function um, where we're mutating or basically transforming this, this connection and changing the, the response type. That's it. Um, the power with plugs is being able to stack these on top of each other. So a lot of the purposes of them are very targeted, just like this one. Um, then the other option is module plug. Um, so these uh, have a behavior that you can use, um, but it requires an init method or init function as well as a call function. The call function is the same spec as the function plug. So you have a connection and a set of options, and then that function will return the connection um, that has been transformed. Um, you set it up the same way, um, where you pass it you know, the module and your options. Um, now the init function, um, it's tricky because its only goal is to prepare options for the call method. Um, but the reason that it's tricky is that you can't depend on it being run at runtime. Uh, there are many cases where that function will be called at compile time, uh, which will make things like uh, creating processes and that sort of thing not work. Um, mm -hmm. So you shouldn't depend on that. And definitely will shouldn't code to that possibility. So basically just only transform data, don't ever spin up any 
processes or, or servers or anything, uh, and you should be good. And like before, an example real quick. Um, most of the time, you won't do anything with your options. Um, or you don't really have to, you just pass the, uh, pass the options back. Um, but same thing as before, right? All we're doing is setting a response content type. Is that a plug to define functions? Which one? Uh, like the put response? response, yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll cover that. It's built into uh, the plug.con um, module. Uh, there's a bunch of, along with the, the struct definition, um, a bunch of functions that deal with working with it, like setting response and uh, request content types, um, you know, fetching um, cookie values and uh, session data and all that stuff, all that's built into that, that module. So we'll cover a, a large majority of it um, when we go through the demo. Um, so next we have um, plug comes with a lot of stuff. Um, now, they're going to be separated into two things, plugs and modules. You have to be careful because with plugs, you'll use the plug macro to load them into your code. But if it's a module, you'll use your, your standard use statement, right? Um, because use? Yeah, so if you, uh, you know how you can do an import for a module? Mm -hmm. uh, use is a special form of import that uh, runs a macro at compile time and has a bunch of setup involved mm -hmm. with it, and you usually get compile time conveniences with it. Um, but if you try and use a plug as a module or a module as a plug, um, you'll run into problems. Um, most of them uh, should say that, hey, this is a module, use this and don't use the plug macro in their documentation. Uh, but most of them are plugs, so uh, it's fair to say that this is what you'll, you'll use plugs more um, from this library as plugs and not modules. But um, here's three that we probably use a lot. Parsers, static, and logger. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory by their names. Um, parsers will parse a request body, right? So if you have, um, you know, form data or multi-part or uh, JSON, what have you, you can create a plug parser that this plug will, or a parser that this plug will use um, to parse that data into an actual data structure. Um, so um, JSON multi-part and, and form data are all built in. Uh, the JSON uh, parser requires a JSON parsing library like Poison. Um, you pass that as an option to the plug when you pull it into your, your, your module, but um, otherwise everything happens on its own. Uh, all automatic for you as long as that's set up for, uh, for your module. Um, static serves static files, obviously. Um, by default, it will serve it from the priv static folder. Uh, so priv slash static. Priv? Yeah, the, the private folder that okay. um, you can do. Uh, it doesn't come by default, I don't think, in the, the mixed new template generation, but hmm. um, it's essentially where you, you would put stuff. So I think Ecto uses the priv folder as a place for your migrations, if I remember right. So that's interesting, the whole priv thing. I thought that was a Phoenix thing, but that's just sort of a it's an, it's, an early, a lot of projects? it's an early thing. Really? Yeah. So that's where people throw like miscellaneous files in general? It can projects? be, yeah. Um, so like in um, like thinking in terms of Ecto, they put your migrations there inside of, uh, well you can point it to wherever you want, but I typically put them in, in the proof folder. Um, I don't know of any real uses other than just random files that you might want to store, but um, the good thing is that it should be bundled in two releases when you build them. Um, so it's a safe place to put things. Um, and then uh, logger, that works with logger, uh, the built-in logging thing that's, uh, that comes in the standard library. Um, you can configure it, um, or you don't really have to configure it at all. It's all done through your, your mix configuration. Mix configuration. Um, so you shouldn't need anything else there. So. On the other side are the, the modules that I was talking about. So these things, they essentially make your life easier uh, with working with Plug. Um, one that I use the most is Router. Um, so it, it provides uh, a bunch of conveniences, like 
uh, using Club Builder uh, so you get the macros, um, and as well as setting up uh, a bunch of functions and conveniences for creating routes for um, you know web application. So the closest thing you can see in like Ruby or something is the uh, like Sinatra, where you have the simple get route do, or Sinatra you don't have to do, but in Elixir you'll have do and then body of whatever happens when that route matches, uh, and you can you know capture uh, variables or, or globs from the route too. So um, and that just happens by like pattern matching the regex, which is nifty. Um, and your debuggers, your your um, better errors esque error screen. So if you have some exception or an error that gets thrown um, at runtime, um, this will present you with a nice visual way of looking at that that error. So you've got a stack trace um, as well as the error messages, uh, you know, any kind of data around there. Mm -hmm. um, but the the key thing with this is that it doesn't handle the error. Right, the errors still happen. Um, so that if you have a runtime error uh, while you're looking at a web app and say you see the screen, well, in your console, you'll still see the error come through in like IEX or wherever. Because um, it's not stopping the error. It just basically says, oh, there's an error. So it shows all the data around it and then lets it pass through. Uh, if you wanted to handle the error and actually do something that wouldn't crash or whatever might happen, um, you can use error handler or error debug. No, error handler is, is the module plug that error handler um, to do that. So essentially, you just define a new function and it says, "Oh, whenever an error occurs, call this function." And you can do whatever, like respond with a five hundred or something. Where do errors go? Like, if you have a measure or something in one of your plugs. Does it go back up to stack? Like, is it a stack plugs? Like. So we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna cover how how they get compiled, right? So this is all a, a bunch of compile time magic, um, but yeah, it's, it's a call stack, the standard call stack. Um, but like errors will occur just uh, and and be handled like normal. So like if you don't do anything, you know your VM is gonna say, oh hey, there was an error, and then everything else continues to work as normal. Um, you know if there are some things that could. Um, Happen like ranch goes and decides to, to take a poop and, and stop working or whatever, right? Things are going to be just as normal as you'd expect them working with Elixir or Erlang. It's all dependent on what happens. I, um, I recently used, and I don't know what it was, I think it was in the standard library, but I think I had to import it, some kind of debugger tool. So you put in the you know, term debug and it runs into that you have a terminal that's open to the code. But it wasn't satisfactory because it seemed like I could mess around, but I couldn't step through. Um, I would just have to quit out, basically. Yeah. Do you know, use any tools? I, I don't know, um, to be honest. Uh, I don't know if there are any um, like debugging tools to let you step through errors as they occur, like you would in like uh, like an IDE or something. Um, the trickiness with that is that with it being like a concurrent distributed kind of platform, yeah. um, you would have to be able to step through asynchronous processes um, as they happen, right? And you could still have other things that are happening, yeah. um, right? Which would be the the, the hardest part of, of that. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of ways to measure that data, and you know log it and all that, um, but I haven't seen any useful tools that will let you step through those. Okay. But you know I've this is still relatively new to me all this stuff, so not to say that there isn't one. Yeah, it might not be developed yet. Yeah. That is uh, and the last one we'll cover is is, is builder. Um, so. I briefly touched that it provides these conveniences for working with the plugs and pub and creating what the library calls a pipeline. Um, so essentially, it's just a, a set of plugs that are, are going to run for a request. That's all that means. Hmm. All right. And with that, um, 
you've got two big forms um, that help you compose these, these plugs. Um, you've got the plug macro, um, which accumulates plugs and um, basically uh, the attribute um, value that we'll, we'll touch base with um, is the, the, the pipeline, right? So it's just a, a list of, of these plugs. Um, and then whenever that module ends up getting called, it will run through all of them as it gets as it was compiled, and we'll see how that how that progresses from the call of the macro um, to the intermediate form of what it looks like in uh, the attribute form for the module, and then something like it would be compiled to. Um, and I those would be plug functions. Uh, plug uh, functions or modules, oh. either or. Um, in the end, it's the same thing. Um, it's just different ways of, of calling them, right? So it's either you have a, a public uh, function that's available in that module, or you have another module that has the init and call functions on it. Either way, it's going to work the same way. It's just slightly different ways of looking at it. What what um, what do you get that in the using a module rather than a plus function that would make you want to take that extra step? Uh, organization is the big part for me. Um, the other side is is Pretty that similar functions together, that kind of thing. Well, if you have a really big one, maybe. Yeah, like if you have a big one, or um, if you just want to organize your modules in a way, or your plugs in a way that makes some sense, so you're not like you've got different function plugs that don't relate to each other. Um, you know that that could be painful, or you know it could um, kind of muddy up your, your other, your actual module that's importing these as plugs. Um, you know, that could be a thing. The, the other, the big point of doing it as a module instead of just a regular function um, is that init function in a module plug. Mm -hmm. um, so if you need to do any kind of pre-work um, pre with your options, it's like if you need to, to parse a, a keyword list and, and do some fanciness with it, um, that would be the best place to do that, is in the init. Whereas, otherwise, you'd have to do it in the, the function body, uh, mm -hmm. which isn't as clean or separation of concerns mm -hmm. okay. and all that stuff. But I typically just go with a, a plug module just because it's, um, in my eyes, a little bit more sane in terms of organization in my head. But it's all personal preference. Mm -hmm. I know Phoenix has a lot of function plugs that it has in its, um, in its router they can do that are available. but. It's whatever. It doesn't really make a lot of difference in the end. Um, and then, yeah, the other the other bit is the compile function. Um, so this is what um, takes that that pipeline and converts it into a quoted term form. So it converts the you know that list into um, the actual AST that will get injected into your module at the end. Um, so. Like I said, we're going to walk through how this, this process really works. Um, so say if we have our module, and in it we have two calls to this plug macro. We've got, uh, we want to set up our logger so that we get these requests logged. Um, and then we're going to use the, the head plug, which eventually, uh, essentially just converts all head requests to get requests. Um, and, and that's all it does. The next form of it would be, um, how it's viewed at when it's getting compiled. Um, so say uh, the plug library would essentially create um, an attribute on the module. Um, and here, we're just calling it plugs, but it could be called whatever. Um, and we're accumulating that, that information. So if you haven't worked with module attributes before, uh, by default, they don't um, accumulate any kind of data. So if you were to do um, say like something like this, and you didn't have accumulate true as an option to it, um, you would essentially in each case just set the value to each one. You wouldn't you know, push it onto a list. Or you could push it onto a list, but you'd have to manage that, that process uh, manually. You, you wouldn't have the, um, the attribute set up doing that for you. So it's just a way of storing data at compile time so your, your documentation, those are module attributes. Um, any kind oh. of like at time that you would do 
uh, in a module just to hold some kind of value, yeah. all of that happens at compile time. Right. So at compile time, your attribute gets replaced uh, anywhere in the code with whatever value you had at that point. I see. So you're saying the documentation wouldn't reflect the plug or the uh, the name of the attribute; it would reflect the actual data. Yeah. So like. Um, like your, your, the documentation is an attribute on the function, right? Um, so you use the same attribute many times. Like you have a documentation for one function and the next. Um, but at compile time, that value for the attribute gets associated with whatever's uh, the, the last. Every time it's used, it it's, uh, takes the value from the last time it was set. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's never set, it's always nil. Um, or if you only set it once, every use of it is going to be that same value. Um, now documentation is a weird because you just pull that information at compile time and do something with it and it doesn't really affect the function. Um, but if you were to say um, have a, a list of defaults that you wanted to use, um, you could <coughs> essentially create that as an attribute and have that list of defaults um, as the actual value and not something you just pass around. So whenever it gets compiled, um, that value, that list of defaults, gets injected everywhere where that attribute gets is placed. Um, here it's kind of similar, but it's all happening in the same location, um, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. But um, here we're we're accumulating this into a single list, and essentially all we're doing is just pushing that into the front of the list. Um, and if you notice, this will be in reverse order, right? So we start with an empty list, and then we push plug on uh, the plug logger onto it and then we push head so they're in reverse order as what we've called. That's important on uh, the compilation process because the compilation process takes that into account and compiles them in the right order mm -hmm. so that they're called in the right order. So logger would be called before head. Correct. Um, so this isn't the exact form but this will give you a, a good idea of, of what's happening. Um, so in each case, we'll take the head of that list of plugs that we've created in the, in the previous step, and then we'll generate a case statement for it, right? And in this case statement, we're calling the plug um, with a, a connection um, as well as, um, as well as, I'll have to first see here in, in plug head call, but that's supposed to be a one, but, um, you take the connection and then um, the init function of it, right? So you're, you're parsing those, um, those options. And you just say, hey, did I get a connection back? If so, cool, let that go through. But if not, uh, do something else with it. I forget the exact form of it, but here we're just you know, returning an error. I don't, that's not exactly what happens. Um, and then you would you'd have that function body for that that head, that first item, that first module or, or plug. Um, and then when you generate the next one, that becomes the body of the new case. So the next one on the, on the, mm. in the list. So it's all nested. Yeah, so you go, um, since you have the list there in reverse order, when you when it gets compiled, it goes inside out. Um, oh, this is what the compile version looks like? Essentially, not exactly, but oh, essentially. Okay. This would be how it would be uh, injected into the module as a compiled form. So plug lets you lay it out in a more uh, e easy to understand way, whereas in compile it nests it all. Well, yeah, it's, it's all you know macros that do all of the stuff for you at compile time, uh -huh. so you don't have to do this manually. Yeah, yeah you can you know obviously create this in a normal module and not have any kind of uh, compile time fanciness that happens. Yeah. Um, this is just some conveniences for doing this stuff yeah, okay. and making sure that you get uh, a same value back in each of these steps. This is more of a philosophical thing. Like, I mean, that, you know, me not being like a hardcore functional person, I don't know about the whole, you know, like the whole macro thing. Like, why? <laughs> like, why isn't it just done like at runtime? You know, like what do you get at the set compile time? So if it was at runtime, um, to have the same uh, assertions about the data that you get back and forth, you'd have to do a case or like a cond or something to map the pattern match those values, right? 
so you know that you're getting a connection back and not some random tuple. And if you were to do that at runtime, you'd have the developer would actually have to write all of that code. Hmm. Right. Um, Where did I lose you? You mean all of this stuff? Yeah, so like well, this is what would be generated, right? So if you were to use just pure functions and not macros, um, you as a developer would have to do something similar to this to get the same assurances. No, I mean, like, why isn't it like it would if you were to do it all at runtime, you would not, you wouldn't write this code, you'd write it differently. You know? you'd, yeah. You'd be, every plug would be a function call and it would be pushing the plug thingies into a list, and then when you ran the plug, it would just sort of recurse on itself into a list or something. Like, why wouldn't you just do that? Uh, what is it macros for the sake of macros or? Um, no, I think it, it would probably be due more to um, uh, to runtime efficiency at that point. Um, whereas at compile time, you can construct in a way that uh, makes sense. But if you were just a recurse on a list of, of functions that you wanted to run, um, you know, for a potentially long um, you know list of functions, you have to go through every single one. Right. Whereas here, this could exit early at any point, just if it didn't match on a, on a connection. So, like, say if, if a logger call. Wouldn't I mean if you did recursion with different? Well, you could you know like pattern matching and stuff. But um, I was just thinking naively. Yeah. Like, yes, there are other options. It's not the only one. You could use like a. Uh, well, like I mean, a or something and do the same thing and do like fmap and, and binding that whole thing and have the exact same thing. Um, it's just different ways of viewing it. I don't know why they chose a macro in the very beginning. Um, I mean, the question is it. why I use a macro in this yeah. circumstance? Yeah. Well, I, I actually haven't really messed with macros. Could you give us kind of a simple definition of what that is? Yeah, it's uh, essentially a... Um, a way to, to construct a construct or to create a construct that uh, occurs at compile time only, right? It would take um, some form like a DSL or something that um, you would actually have in your module, but when the, that module got compiled, it would take that DSL and then convert it into actual uh, code that would be run okay. at runtime. Okay, so it's an easy way to implement a DSL. Yeah, it's, it's a way, yeah a way to do a DSL. Um, but um, a lot of the times you'll see macros used in places where um, you want to take complexity out of the runtime, so you do it compile time. Okay. Um, that's where I use it. That's the biggest draw for macros. Otherwise, if you don't have any benefit, then it's better to use a function okay. um, just because of simplicity's sake. Because um, trying to do both macros can be painful, mm -hmm. um, because you're all you're essentially altering how the module is generated and how it's viewed by the runtime, mm -hmm. the virtual machine. Uh, so, yeah, that's a narrow view at it. But yeah. Okay. So it, part of it is kind of pushing um, decisions and complexity into uh, compile time. Yeah. So when it, the actual module is called at runtime. You don't have to worry about that complexity. It's already passed that test. Yes. It's set up ready to go. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I don't know, Eric. I don't know. Yeah, you could do this other ways with just pure functions and, and some regular pattern matching. But I just get worried because people are like, whenever people talk about macros, they're like, oh, don't use macros. And then everywhere you look, there's macros. You know, you're like, what's going on? Not the whole story. Yeah, I usually use macros in a way that either a it's going to provide me a, a compile time benefit. Yeah, it makes sense to pre generate stuff. Yeah, you know? um, or along it may not give me the exact uh, runtime benefit that I'm looking for, but it creates the developer experience a little bit better. It's like if you had a lot of code that you had to write for something, where you can write a simple macro to do it, I'd rather go the macro route mm -hmm. and take that generation. Uh, to an automated form that you know, the compiler does. It's like I have a, a simple HTTP router um, 
library that all it does is create a way to do routes similar to um, what Phoenix uses now, but I created it for Sugar way back when. So essentially all it is is a set of macros and it takes, um, you know, a, a HTTP method, a route, module name, and a function name. Uh, and then it takes those and converts it back into something that Plug can use to actually route the request. Okay, so you need, you need to write a macro when you want to interface with other macros. You could. Well, I mean, because if, it, if I was Plug was a macro, you, you would just make a function to do that. Well, just, just the Plug macro bits, right? Yeah. So this bit, the Plug here is the only thing. I was talking about Plug as a library. Um, you don't have, it's nice to use uh, macros to work with other macros, but you don't have to. It depends on how the macro works, right? Oh. How it expands. You can use it, sometimes I think you can use a macro outside of a function, but I'd have to take a look. But you don't have to use a macro to do weird things. <laughs> you usually do, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, we're almost done with this uh, slide deck, so we'll finish up. Um, you know, briefly, connection adapters, um, there's a behavior um, that uh, defines how these requests and responses are um, received and sent from these web servers. So when you create an adapter, it says, hey, okay, this is how you interface with me. Uh, that's the adapter, and then a lot of the time, well, the only case right now, um, there's an additional module that actually provide some conveniences. Um, so the Cowboy adapter has an additional module that allows you to create an HTTP listener or an HTTPS listener, yada yada. You get all these stuff, you can create web apps. Cool. Um, so now we have a demo. Um, so we're gonna cover creating a new uh, product from scratch and um, you know, setting up stuff, testing it, so on and so forth. Message. Everybody see that? It's gigantic on my screen. No, it's not. What? Let it go. 